Okay, all right. So we're happy to have uh, Ken Ono give a speak, speech on or a talk on distribution of partition statistics in arithmetic progressions. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Dina Carr. So it's an honor and a pleasure to, to be with you uh, to celebrate Balu's 70th birthday. Um, as, as, as probably everyone knows, I, I have a very uh, special connection with uh, the Indian mathematical community. And in honor of Balu's contributions to, to many contributions to analytic number theory, I'd like to give a talk on a subject which uh, has a very long history in analytic number theory. Uh, and I'll describe some recent work, uh, ongoing work with Katrin Bringman, my PhD student, Will Craig, and Josh Mayles, who will be finishing his PhD in Cologne, uh, I think later this spring. So the title of this lecture is Distribution of Partition Statistics and Arithmetic Progressions. And uh, let me get started. So just a little bit of background, it's well known just to uh, fix notation. My, one of my favorite functions, as I think many of you will know, is the partition function P of N, which counts the partitions of integers. So the notation that I will use, use throughout this talk is that a partition of an integer N is any non-increasing sequence, which I will denote by capital lambda of positive integers which sum to N. P of N is the count of the partitions of N, and it's almost obligatory in many, many partition talks to start with this example. There are five partitions of four, and I've listed them for you here. The connection to analytic number theory that, um, uh, that, that is embodied by the partition function is this famous theorem of Hardy and Ramanujan that gives this asymptotic formula for P of n. P of n is asymptotic to one over four n root three times e to the pi root two n over three. And well, I, I, I think this is very well known. Another famous contribution to the theory of partitions by Ramanujan is this theorem, his famous congruences, which say that for every non-negative integer n, the partition function satisfies these congruences mod five, seven, and 11, when you require that the argument lie in uh, a specific arithmetic progression of the same modulus. Now, Ramanujan's proof of these congruences, well, he had a couple, but most of them involved uh, manipulations of infinite series that were, that were presented as infinite products. And so, <laughs> What, what one could ask for, and this is what Freeman Dyson did ask for, is a combinatorial description or a combinatorial explanation for these congruences. So what Freeman Dyson offered is the rank. It's a very beautiful idea in, in its elegance. A rank of a partition is the largest part minus its number of parts. So if we let <coughs> n of m n be the number of partitions of n with rank m, and we could consider this example. So if you list the five partitions of four, they are listed here. I then list for you the largest parts of these in order. I count for you the number of summands in each of these partitions. And then I take the difference as, as required by Dyson's rank and you get these numbers. It turns out that if you reduce these numbers mod five, you get one representative for each of the residue classes mod five. And the point I'm making is, well, P of five N plus four is always a multiple of five. And in the first case where n is zero, the five partitions are divided into five equal classes by this procedure. Allows me to explain the idea of Dyson's conjecture. If you study the congruence properties of this rank statistic and define the function n a b of n to be the count of the number of partitions of n with rank congruent to a mod b, <coughs> what Dyson conjectured is are these two identities, these two equations, which are valid for every choice of n and a. So each of the residue classes mod five for the rank gets its fair share of partitions when the argument, the size is five n plus four. And each of the possible values of the rank mod seven, because a is freely chosen, gets its exact fair share of the partitions when you partition numbers of the form seven n plus five. So of course, a proof of this conjecture would imply the Ramanujan congruence as mod five and seven. And that was famously done uh, in the uh, mid 1950s by Atkin and Swinnerton Dyer. 
in the spirit of that, even though there might not be congruences, you could ask what is the nature of the distribution of Dyson's rank function? That was an open problem for quite some time. Uh, and in a Duke paper about 12 years ago, 13 years ago, I guess, uh, Katrin Bringman proved that Dyson's rank functions satisfy this equidistribution behavior. Namely, if you fix an arithmetic progression A mod B for the ranks mod B, and you divide those numbers by P of N and let N tend to infinity, these ratios are uh, one over B. You have equidistribution. This turns out to be uh, one of the corollaries of the development of the theory of harmonic MOS forms. It turns out that the power series that Freeman Dyson had written down uh, could be extended, completed to give you examples of weight one half harmonic MOS forms. And if you do the usual orthogonality relations on characters, what you can find is that the mock modular forms line up in a suitable way so that you can apply the circle method uh, to arrive at these equidistribution statements. So the natural question that I want to consider here is of that type, but not necessarily with respect to congruence. It's just of this type because recently a number of partition functions that can be stratified uh, have, come to the, have, have come into the light. So as just a very general problem, suppose, capital, suppose that S of lambda is any inter, integer valued partition invariant. So lambda is a partition and just to find some statistic called S of lambda. And in the spirit of, of, of uh, Katrin's work on Dyson's rank function, you can ask, what can we say about the function C of A, B of N? that count the number of size n partitions lambda with invariant congruent to A mod B. So in particular, of course, P of n would then be a sum of these B different functions. Each of these functions here count the number of partitions of n where the, the invariant is in a fixed residue class mod B. And a, and a naive guess would be that for most partition invariants S that we would get equidistribution. All right, so of course I can't prove a general theorem about this. There won't be a general theorem in today's lecture about classifying kinds of invariants for which you have equidistribution. But what I am gonna do is take two very important families of functions and study their distributions in this context. So there is a lot of recent work in representation theory and string theory that involves uh, generating functions that uh, are sometimes related to modular forms sometimes quantum modular form, so on and so forth, where the power series come from what are called the partition hook numbers. And in fact, every modular form on SL2Z is one of these gadgets. And I want to study the distributions of homology, the Betty numbers on endpoint Hilbert schemes, which are also encoded by the partitions of N by, via representation theory. And I wanna ask, whether there is a phenomenon, something like Dirichlet's theorem on primes and arithmetic progressions, where instead these invariants uh, are equidistributed. So I'll, ad I'll address these two topics one at a time because they have very different answers. So if your first guess is that we will be proving equidistribution theorems, uh, well, that guess would is only sometimes right, but most of the time wrong. So to define the hook numbers, if you've never seen them before, it's, it's, it's really quite simple. Uh, so for every partition lambda, you can associate a Ferrer's Young diagram, which is a staircase, uh, uh, a descending staircase pattern of dots or, or steps, if you'd like, where in each successive row, I have lambda m parts, where m is the mth part. And for each entry in one of these diagrams, for each node, uh, each node has a corresponding hook number. Here's the formula. If you were to order the elements in this diagram but as you would entries in a matrix, row I, column J, or I guess here row K, uh, column J, then the hook number is given by this simple formula where the lambda J prime denotes the number of nodes in column J. Why is it called the hook number? because th this number is exactly the number of nodes that sort of embodies the hook that is covered by these differences. 
this talk begins with a discussion of the distribution of T hooks. So in any partition of size N, there are N hooks and, there, and for every positive integer T, some subset of them possibly empty will be those hooks which are themselves multiples of T. All right, so that's all we need to know about a definition. So let me give you an example. If we consider this partition of 10, five plus four plus one, I've, I've, instead of using dots, I use squares. Each square represents one of these nodes. And in each one of these squares, I've labeled the hook numbers. So here you see three ones because there are no hooks that can really legitimately be assembled from those corners. Here is a hook number of four. So just by tracing, following the tracing of this little hand, you see that would be a count of four. Here's a count of five. And here is a count of seven for the very largest hook. So in particular, just to set notation, math cal h of lambda will be the set of all hook numbers. It's a multi-set. So if there's multiplicity, the elements are repeated. When t is two, the only even hook numbers that you find in this diagram are two and four. For t equals three, there are only two multiples of three here. And so the multiple, and so the three hooks are two copies of three. Why might you care about the hook numbers? Well, if you've taken a course on representation theory that has as uh, a, a section, the representation theory of the symmetric group, then you've certainly discussed or, or heard about the role of the hook numbers in representation theory. And just in one very simple theorem to summarize what you would know, we know that um, the number of irreducible representations of the symmetric group SN is P of N. That doesn't need the hook numbers. That just needs to know that the number of conjugacy classes in SN equals the number of partitions of N via cycle structures. It turns out that in fact, using a, a decorated forms of these Ferrer's diagrams, which are called tableau, where you enumerate the boxes with, with various uh, uh, labeling schemes, the symmetric group acts on these tableaus. And you can explicitly construct all of the irreducible representations of SN from this action. So if you can list all the partitions of N, you can explicitly construct by brute force all of the irreducible representations. You need to know how to compute the dimension of this representation. It's the number of these tableau. And this is where the hook numbers come into play. The dimension of this representation is this combinatorial formula. N factorial is the order of SN. And what you divide into N factorial to get the dimension is the product of the N many hook numbers. By the way, it's a non-trivial exercise to show that this number on the right must be an integer for every partition, okay? I think the simplest argument follows from uh, uh, a combinatorial count and a count actually has to of course be an integer. All right, so it is in this way that if you're interested in studying the local global properties of representations of the symmetric group, you are forced to understand the P, P divisibilities of these hook numbers. If you wanna study the modular representation theory via Brouwer, you need to know how many P's can factorize into hook numbers in the bottom. I worked on this many, many years ago with Andrew Granville. There was one outstanding problem that had been open for some time. It is the classification of all the integers N for which there is at least one partition where the P hooks don't exist. This was called the Brouwer's problem 19. And we solved that. And one of the nice corollaries of that statement is that for every prime at least five, there's always an irreducible representation of every finite simple group, including the uh, sporadic ones. For every prime at least five, there's always at least one irreducible representation of every finite simple group whose reduction mod P remains irreducible. And, 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 and so that would be one application of this kind of theorem. But more recently through the work of Zagier and Nekrasov and Okunkov, we have a renewed interest in the distribution of the hook numbers. So I think many of you might know this, Nekrasov and Okunkov in their work on statistical physics produced something like this, this formula, which can be thought of as, as uh, a major elaboration of cases of the Jacobi triple product identity. 
it says for any complex number z, the infinite product one minus q to the n to the z minus one, that has a closed form. And what is that closed form? As a power series, it's a sum over all the partitions of integers, q to the size. And what is the coefficient of q to the size? Well, it's the sum of these strange finite products, one for every partition of fixed size. All right, so here is a closed formula, for example, for Ramanujan's tau function. If z is 25, this is the tw essentially the delta function. And so you have a very strange formula for tau arising from the partition numbers in terms of their hooks. So this is one minus z divided by h squared, where you factorize over all n choices of the hook numbers. Now, as amazing as this looks, this formula has many extensions and variants. Let me just offer you one. So a combinatorialist in France by the name of Hahn proved this generalization, where if t is any positive integer and, z and zeta is any root of unity, then for any complex number c, this ratio of infinite products as a Q series has Fourier coefficients, which are literally just expanded in terms of products over all the partitions of n. These strange expressions, when you factorize over those hook numbers that are themselves multiples of t. Up here, you factorize over all the hook numbers in, all the, in a fixed partition of lambda. Here, by introducing this parameter t, you're only taking the product over those hook numbers, which are themselves multiples of t, which indicates that many partitions don't even occur in this sum and they can only occur uh, if they have multiples of t in them as hook numbers. So if you grew up reading any of these beautiful works of Ramanujan and others involving infinite products, then early on in your, in your mathematical life, you would have come across these, these identities of Euler, Jacobi, and Gauss. They're beautiful examples of theta function identities. Let me just point out for you how beautiful and how easy it is to derive these formulas, say, from the formula of Nekrasov in Akunkov. For example, let's consider the case where h is 2. If h is 2, um, if h is 2, I'm sorry, where z is 4, let's let z be 4. If z is 4, 4 minus 1 is 3. And this will correspond to an identity uh, that I just flashed a moment ago, and I'll show you in a moment. So if z is 4, think about the product 1 minus 4 over h squared. This product is definitely going to be 0 for any partition that has a hook number of 2. And it's just an elementary calculation to reveal that the only partitions that don't have a hook number of 2 are the perfect staircase partitions, 1 plus 2 plus 3. They have to be consecutive parts. Well, if you apply that here, what you've done is written down an absolutely elementary proof of the Jacobi identity. And so if you're interested in writing down Hecke characters or explicit formulas for weight one modular forms, so on and so forth, these kinds of theorems make explicit contact with things you might be more accustomed to coming from homomorphisms of, for example, ideal class groups. So, this is why we would care about the distribution of the T hooks, because theorems about them will then have consequences for Fourier expansions of all modular forms. It is a theorem of Bloch and Okunkov that all modular forms can be derived as finite algebraic expressions from the series that I've shown you and their relatives. So what I want to do here is now study this, the, the, these sets, math cal HT of lambda. So I put this in red because I wanted to remind you what this is. HT of lambda is the number of T hooks in the partition lambda. And what PTAB of N is counting, it's only counting those partitions N of N for which this total number is in the residue class A mod B. So the density function that we would want to calculate is this psi sub t a b of n. It's just the ratio of p t a b of n divided by p of n. So again, out of all the partitions of n, the numerator is only counting those where the number of t hooks mod b equals a. So in the spirit of the question I began with, 
for large n, what can we say about the distribution, this decomposition of P of n? So let me show you some numbers. So let's consider the number of three hooks mod three. So for the integers that are listed here, out of all the partitions of 100, a little over 43% of them will have a total number of three hooks, which is itself a multiple of three. And likewise, for these other two columns. And by the time you get up to 2,500, it looks like the partitions of size n are equally distributed between the three possible values. So let's just make that as a remark. The number of three hooks seems to be equidistributed mod three. Let me give you another example. Let's take the number of two hooks, but mod three. Now something completely different happens. What is different here might should surprise you. Let's look at this. What this says is if you write down all the partitions of 5,100 and you count the number of hooks numbers that are even, it is never true. You cannot find one partition of 5,100 where the number of even hooks mod three is congruent to two out of the many, many, I mean, think about the orders of magnitude, the number of partitions of 5,100, you cannot find a single partition at all where the number of two hooks are two mod three. And in fact, it looks like there are twice as many cases where the number of two hooks, um, there are a multiple of three than the number of two hooks being congruent to one mod three. But at first glance, this should, should surprise you. It never happens. You cannot find one. So what's going on? And does it matter that maybe deceptively, I showed you ends in this table where the n's are multiples of three? I mean, surely, could it be that there are no partitions of n that when you count the number of two hooks, you don't get a total number, which is two mod three? All right. So let's do another example. Let's count the number of four hooks mod three, and you get this. So out of all the partitions of 12n, where n is in this table, you see and can guess that something very funny is going on. Out of all the partitions of 12n, it looks like about 44% of them have the property that the number of four hooks occur in clumps of three, in groups of three. About a third of them have four hooks that occur in one more than clumps of three, and so on and so forth. So what you might guess is that for the number of four hooks counted modulo three, if n were to go to infinity and you only counted the multiples of 12, it looks like these, these ratios tend to a distribution of four ninths, one third, and two ninths. This is very far from equidistribution. So let me tell you what we've proven. We've proven everything uh, along these lines. And let me first tell you about the, the limiting cases uh, in terms of a general theorem. And then I'll tell you really what's going on at two and three, because it's really quite surprising, I think. So pick any positive integer t, not one and pick any arithmetic progression A mod B. And for simplicity, let's consider B to be an odd prime. Then P T A B of N, this is the proportion of partitions of N where the number of T hooks is A mod B. We get an asymptotic formula. I have to tell you what this function C T A B of N is. It turns out it's a very nice function, which thankfully is periodic in N modulo B. And so what you get is you get equal distribution, of course, when this function is constantly one over B. And when it's not constantly one over B, very funny things happen in terms of unequal distribution. So I should say this theorem is an extension of a special case where T equals two proven by um, my students earlier last year. That follows quite easily from the theory of modular forms. And what we wanted to do was extend this uh, because you need to go beyond modularity uh, when T isn't two. So here are the formulas for C, T, A, B of N. So I state it this way. Again, if B is an odd prime, we have formulas for arbitrary B, but they get more complicated. For B an odd prime and an arithmetic progression A mod B, what C, T, A, B of N is, it's one over B, which would be equi equi equidistribution plus these quantities depending on the relationship 
between B and T. All right, if B divides T, then this error term isn't there at all, and we have equidistribution. If P does not divide T, depending on whether T is even or odd, you're in one of these two cases. And depending on whether you're, which case you're in, the, end of the, the role of A and B appears here and here. This is a quadratic residue symbol, and epsilon B is the square root of um, the order two character mod four. So I don't want to give you the recipe for A, I, B, T of N, but it's basically a certain residue class indicator function, um, which, is, which is a little bit complicated to write down. Uh, and it's kind of hard for me to explain a, a beautiful explanation for the formula other than to say, this is what you get out at the end of the calculation. So the gist is you can only get equidistribution of T hooks in the sense of a Dirichlet type theorem only in the case where you have divisibility, where the B divides into the T and we're studying the T hooks. Intuitively, you might have guessed that this should be reversed, uh, but no, that's not the case. When T equals two and three, something very surprising happens. So we're counting the number of two hooks, the number of three hooks in all the partitions of N. It turns out that there are arithmetic progressions where those total counts must be zero. And I don't have an elementary proof of that. So if L is an odd prime and A1 and A2 are arithmetic progressions mod L for which this quadratic residue condition holds, then P2 of A1L of partitions of the size LN plus A2 is always zero. You cannot find a partition of size LN plus A2 where the number of two hooks is congruent to A1 mod L, never exists going off to infinity, despite the fact P of N grows at an astronomical rate. So in particular, um, and, and, if, and in the case of three, where you count the number of three hooks, if L is two mod three, and A1 and A2 are arithmetic progressions, A1 mod L squared, these are now arithmetic progressions mod L squared, these are progressions mod L, if L exactly divides this number, then there are no three hooks of partitions of the size. There are no partition, there are no integers L squared N plus A2 where the total number of three hooks lies in this progression mod L squared. You cannot find one. I've shown this to many people who work in hardcore combinatorics um, and uh, they seem to be very surprised by this. Our proof uses modularity and so I'd be very interested in knowing whether there is a direct combinatorial proof. In no other case do the distributions from the previous theorem tend to zero. In every other case for, B, for, for T's other than two and three, the theorem will give you an asymptotic here, which is positive and a positive proportion of P of N. All right. So I don't give the proof here, but let me just say, in the final analysis, if you do a little bit of voodoo with the generating functions I'm going to manipulate shortly, you can find a connection to theta functions and weight one Eisenstein series, and then it becomes the stuff of complex multiplication. Just as an example, if L is three, when P is two, you find these three situations where this function is identically zero. N is anything. So in these three arithmetic progressions mod three, there's a corresponding arithmetic progression for the total count, which never includes any, any integers at all. And similarly for, L, for, for the number three hooks, if you choose L to be two, you get these situations where for all N, these counts are exactly zero. And so there's lots of this, this, this field is just literally full of very strange um, uh, uh, like, how to say, a uh, very strange phenomenon. All right, so I will sketch the proof of that later, uh, but let me just quickly touch on another example of theorems of this type that comes from algebraic geometry. So uh, as, a, as, a, as an extension of the representation theory that underscores the work of Okunkov and, and, and Zagier, uh, that representation extends to Hilbert schemes on endpoints. So um, what to say? These Hilberts, one generally studies um, homology, Betty numbers, and, and, and Hodge numbers, 
for, for projective varieties of, uh, of large dimension. We generally are interested in, in those that come from number theory or combinatorics. And the ones that I want to study here are the nth Hilbert schemes um, on endpoints. If you don't know the background on this, uh, I don't have time here to explain it, but it's beautifully described in a book by Lothar Gurcher and, and a recent uh, Inventionis paper by Buriak, Feigen, and Nakajima. So we want to denote the Hilbert scheme of endpoints on C2 by this. You, you can think of this as the symmetrization of, uh, of a symmetric group action on endpoints over C2. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to study the Betty numbers, the dimension on homology uh, for these Hilbert schemes. So if I consider the Hilbert scheme on endpoints and I can choose the jth homology, uh, the jth Betty number is this dimension. And what I wanna do is I wanna add together these Betty numbers where the index is in a fixed arithmetic progression, A mod B. So uh, these are essentially collecting uh, coefficients uh, of what are called the Poincaré polynomials. Uh, and, and, that's, and that might be the language that you would first learn, uh, hear about them. In the setting that I'm considering, it turns out that the homology, just like the representations of the symmetric group, the homology is literally labeled in a one-to-one -one way with the partitions of N. And that's why I choose this example. So you can prove using their work, well, it's, it's, it's explicit in their work rather, you can prove for every N that P of N is the sum of these Betty numbers. And so when I break up P of N as a sum of these numbers, capital B, what I'm doing is I'm adding up the dimensions of homology where the index is in a fixed progression mod B, very much like the Dyson statistic or the counting functions I described uh, in the first part of this talk. So for large N, what is the distribution where the homology is distributed among the partitions of N? We can define our Betty distribution functions in this way, an exact analogy with um, everything I'm describing in this talk. And I can give you a numerical example. So if we consider the homology on endpoint Hilbert schemes and count uh, and add up those dimensions for indices that are uh, in arithmetic progressions mod three. So it's like taking a polynomial of degree N and you're just adding up the coefficients, which are zero mod three. That would be like this, adding up the coefficients in your polynomial whose, whose indices are one mod three. That, that would be like computing this proportion, so on and so forth. What you see in this numerical example is that it looks like the homology is tending towards an equal distribution. I won't show you, I think, any other tables in this, in this case, because in this case, we have essentially have equal distribution. So as n goes to infinity, it turns out that, um, the, that the sum of these dimensions with multiplicity has this asymptotic formula. The part that I'm circling with the hand is P of n. What is D of a, b? It's the proportion. And what that proportion is falls into one of only three elementary classes. It turns out if we distribute the homology in arithmetic progressions mod B, where B is odd, these counts are equidistributed. However, if B is even, we only have equidistribution, but among those residue classes, which are A mod B, where A is itself even. And in this case, for simple reasons, the homology vanishes for odd indices A. That's well known. So the point is that in, in, in terms of the, the Betty numbers and more generally the Hodge numbers for these endpoint Hilbert schemes, you essentially have equal distribution when you accept in those cases where you clearly cannot have equal distribution because you have vanishing. So in the spirit of, of this conference, Balu uh, has made many contributions to analytic number theory. He's certainly an expert, of course, on the circle method. And so what won't come as a surprise is that all of these theorems rely on some variant of the famous hardy ramanujan circle method. So just very quickly, for any arbitrary partition statistic S, you can consider the two variable generating function at the outset as a formal power series 
where uh, the coefficient of Q to the N is the sum over Z to the partition statistics of for all, when you sum over all the partitions of fixed size, say N. And of course, just by first principles, you can use uh, orthogonality of roots of unity. And so it's very easy to write down the generating function for these invariants in arithmetic progressions. And so if we want to carry out the circle method, all we need to do is realize these functions GS of Q, presumably as some nice analytic function on the unit disk. And then what we want to do is carry out Cauchy's residue, uh, the Co Cauchy's circle, Cauchy's, Cauchy's integral formula to derive um, our counts. This is exactly what happens in P of N. It's quite standard. And so all I really have to tell you is a recipe for finding these seed functions, G of S zeta Q. So I see a small typo. This GSQ should have a second variable Z in it. And that second variable Z is what is being specialized here to go from here to here. All right. So in the situation where these generating functions arise from modular forms, this is all very well understood. And often, unless the weight is positive, often you get exact formulas by means of Rademacher expansions, something like this. And so when that is the case, you run the circle method, you get a formula like this, and you just ask, what is the ratio between the first Klusterman sum that arises here in P of n when compared to the finite sum of Klusterman sums that would presumably come out of a calculation of this function? All right. However, uh, in most of the theorems I've described today, we don't actually have modular forms. So you have to do something a little bit different. It's not dramatically different. It's, uh, these are ideas that are well known. They go back to E.M. Wright in some of his early work involving the circle method, which certainly didn't require anything about modularity. My time is running short. Uh, so let me just say, if you've never seen this theorem of Wright, you should look it up because it is quite useful. Instead of just going to um, the standard application of the circle, circle method, say for P of N, it turns out that um, Wright many years ago wrote down a closed, ex closed procedure for carrying out the circle method for power series that factorizes the product of two power series that have asymptotic expansions that you can encode. When you can do this, you get a nice closed formula for a very strong asymptotic for the resulting coefficients. All right, so I don't wanna go through and read this line by line, but my point is, is that many of the, uh, the convenient features in running the circle method for modular forms uh, don't require the full strength of modularity. It really only requires locating uh, the dominant poles on the unit disk of your power series and being able to control uh, the behavior as you approach roots, other roots of unity. Uh, and this is a, a nice recipe for kind of uh, deriving a framework for what is sufficient for getting results of, um, of that quality. So what I owe you are descriptions for these generating functions. So in the case of counting T hooks, these theorems where you had unequal distribution, uh, Han himself wrote down this generating function. This generating function has this essential modular form living here on the right, and it's decorated by the reciprocal of this uh, infinite product right here. This infinite product is like a twist to the zeta eight, Dedekind eta function. So in particular, if you let Z be one, everything cancels and only gives you P of N. And that, as, as you know, is the reciprocal has as a generating function, the reciprocal of the eta function. Uh, and, and, so, and so we run with the circle method on that. For the Betty numbers, it's much worse, but it's still an infinite product that never specializes to be um, a, a modular form, but does specialize to be power series that we can uh, manipulate via Wright's circle method. And so Goethe himself uh, in, in the early 90s, this is from his ICM work, wrote down a closed formula for the generating function of the Poincaré polynomials for endpoint Hilbert schemes. 
The Poincaré polynomial is the polynomial whose coefficients one by one are the Betty numbers. And so if we want to assemble those Betty numbers, all you have to do is go through and apply a standard orthogonality calculation involving roots of unity. But what is the point? If z is one, this nicely collapses again to the generating function for p of n, which is the starting point for trying to describe how the partitions of n decompose into Betty distributions. All right. So in the last couple of minutes, let me just tell you what is true about these three power series. So the, the non-modular components of the factors of these generating functions all fall into one of these three infinite products, F1, F2, and F3. So what we need to do is establish the asymptotic behavior as Q approaches roots of unity from within the unit disk for each of these. Okay, so here's a theorem, a lemma about the asymptotics for F2. Let me just say, this isn't so difficult to work out. It is almost an immediate consequence of what we know about Dedekind's eta function. So let me just say this is essentially a twisted form of Dedekind's eta function. The quantities on the right, if you're not familiar with them, they come from standard calculations involving Dedekind sums. The other two factors are much worse. So if you want to study the asymptotic near roots of unity of F1 and F3, uh, this is our theorem. So if zeta is a, a bth primitive root of unity, where b is an odd prime, zeta isn't one, then as you approach zero, you get that uh, we have this asymptotic expansion as a function of x. So you can see it's a bit nasty. If you're wondering what these terms are, this phi is the lurch transcendent, okay? And as you can see from this expansion, this is nothing like what you would expect from a modular form. For F3, you can work a similar thing where you get an asymptotic expansion again, approaching zero. Approaching zero is like letting Q tend to one. And it'll turn out that the dominant pole for all of our functions are at Q equals one. So this is what's relevant. And again, you get a very strange asymptotic expansion where SB is a certain exponential sum, uh, which is clearly very far from modular. How do you prove asymptotics like this? Well, it's, it's not very complicated. It's just um, a, an ad adaptation of the standard Euler-Maclaurin summation. So here is your standard Euler-Maclaurin summation for an arithmetic function f, where you can relate uh, a discrete sum on f to its integral, uh, where the error term is an explicit sum of values of the of Bernoulli polynomials evaluated at derivatives. And if you have a power series, which has an asymptotic expansion, say summation C of n x to the n, well, you can use this Euler-Maclaurin summation to derive this nice asymptotic expression as an asymptotic expansion at x, where, uh, where, um, where this error term, again, comes from uh, uh, the Bernoulli numbers. So there's a lot of details that you have to get right, but this is the idea. And when you carry out that idea, what you get are those formulas. I guess I was going to say more about this key lemma. Um, but let me just say that if you apply euler maclaurin summation adapted to computing the asymptotic expansion at 0, which again, keep in mind, is computing the asymptotic expansion near q equals 1, what you then get are the asymptotic expansions of the theorem I described above. All right. How does this lemma apply? You take the logarithms of these two infinite products, and then you exponentiate back to get the asymptotics. So at the end of the day, if you then insert all of these asymptotic expressions for F1, F2, and F3 into the closed formulas of those generating functions, you get theorems like this. These theorems have the property that um, you get uh, very tight asymptotics. It tells you when you have equal distribution and when you don't. In the case of T hooks, as I say here, this only happens when B divides T. When B doesn't divide T, it's a very different distribution. One which I'd like to understand heuristically. There's nothing about the combinatorics that tells me why 
there should be a preference for counting partitions of a certain type over another when, when I don't understand why that would be. And, and in the special case where t equals two and three, these constants turn out to be zero uh, in infinitely many cases. But that these constant turn out to be zero is only a reflection of the fact that these partition values turn out to identically be zero, an even stronger statement. And so there is a web of relations, a web of choices of parameters, A1 and A2, where the total number of two hooks and the total number of three hooks is absolutely prohibited. And I would be very interested in finding uh, an explanation for that. Our proof is very ad hoc. It actually uses the generating function. And I have to somehow believe that there's some symmetric group action somehow say that shows that for some reason, two hooks and three hooks have to form clumps. And for Betty numbers on Hilbert schemes, it's, the situation is much nicer. It turns out that the group action is equidistributed on homology, except in cases where parity considerations prohibit it. All right, so that's what I wanted to say. I think, uh, and I hope that many people in the audience grew up with the hardy ramanujan asymptotic formula for P of N. And for those of you, and for Balu, happy birthday. And I hope this kind of uh, contemporary version of these very old hardy ramanujan type problems uh, is interesting to you. And perhaps someone will wanna take on the task of trying to find an elementary proof of what I claim for t equals two and three at, because I don't have the foggiest idea of why that would be true. And, and, and quite honestly, I have to believe that there's an elementary proof that as um, that a professional combinatorialist, combinatorialist could probably spot, prop, hopefully. And with that, let me conclude. Happy birthday, Balu. Okay. Thank All right, you. Uh, are there any questions or comments? Yes, Shamali, or and Yuan yet? So both, oh, several people have. Okay, well, I do. I do have a ha oh. hard stop in a couple minutes because I'm running a graduate yeah. orientation. So, so very quickly, okay. yes. Yes. Any questions? I thought a couple of people raised their hands, or maybe they were applauding. Yeah. Any questions? All right, well, so, thank you very so, much then. Okay, all right. Okay, let's thank the speaker again, please, yeah. Many of you are muted, so maybe you should unmute to be able to.